John chapter uh, 1, and we're going to work into John chapter 2 this evening. The very first miracle that Jesus performed, we'll get to that here shortly. It's good to have you with us uh, here and online. We appreciate you coming. Uh, remember to pray for those that are still uh, sick. Janice and Anthony Merciel both have uh, the China virus and um, they had Jan in the hospital for a little while and they sent her home and um, sounded it, her situation sounded exactly like mine. You get dehydrated, you don't eat, that leads to a whole nother bunch of problems and um, double pneumonia in both lungs. And it's a, it's a bad, it's a bad booger is what it is. And uh, so Anthony and Janice and anybody else that has suffered with this in the past or is suffering with it now, uh, my heart goes out to you. Uh, those who have loved ones that have been affected by it, and maybe even loved ones that have passed on because of it. Uh, my heart goes out to you because it's, it was a bad thing that China did bad thing that and they did it on purpose i don't believe it came from bats baseball or otherwise um uh, just it, it aggravates me we're in a we're in a big mess in this country and it's not getting any better and uh i'll be ready for jesus to come back any day now amen but while he's got us here we're going to tarry we're going to do his will we're going to do what he says until he comes. We're going to suffer through what we must suffer through. Because I promise you, I double promise you, the Bible double promises you. Double, triple promises you that when Christ appears in the air, we're going to forget all about it. Boom, gone, just like that. Looking forward to that day. Amen. All right, John chapter 1. Let's... Uh, Let's start here, verse 35. We're going to read our way down. And um, we've been introduced now in John chapter 1 to Jesus being the Word. John the Baptist introducing Jesus as the one he's been preaching about, the one who's coming after him, the one that he's... It's not John who's teaching Jesus. It's Jesus teaching John everything. There, and... I mentioned um, here a while back this Gnostic gospel idea that John was the teacher, the master to Jesus, who was the student, the disciple of John the Baptist. And believe it or not, there is a huge resurgency in the Gnostic gospel doctrine. And I may piece that together for you and help you to understand what that is. If it's something that I don't, as I'm looking out in the world and seeing what people are believing, seeing what people are teaching and preaching and trying to get others to believe and so on, if I don't think the Gnostic Gospels were any big deal, I wouldn't mention them. I would just say, hey, there used to be this thing. Nobody believes it anymore. Don't worry about it. But remember what we've learned from Ecclesiastes. There is no new thing under the sun. The thing that hath been is the thing that shall be. Paul dealt with it in his day. The early uh, apostles addressed the issue of a fake gospel, a fake Jesus, a fake God, a different God than the God that's in this Bible. And this idea of Gnosticism is gaining ground again amongst those who are in the new age those who are in certain churches and it wouldn't surprise me a bit if it started entering into the denominations that at one time used to be conservative remember when they removed this bible out of any ministry don't care who it is when this bible is gone away from it the corruption sets in you have to replace it with something and so they replace it with a false gospel. And I may put it together and teach on this one these days. But anyway, John chapter 1, verse 35. Uh, the Bible says, Again the next day, after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. 
So now Jesus, and, he, and you notice that he's not selected any disciples until this point. He is now baptized. I have an assumption, even though it's not mentioned directly in the scriptures, that probably by this time, Joseph, Jesus, or the, the husband of Mary, has died. That's what I think. Uh, we know that by the time Jesus is crucified, Mary is alone. There's no one to take care of her. And Jesus from the cross says to John, John, behold thy mother. Woman, behold thy son. Speaking of John. So John is going to look after Mary now because I think Joseph has died as of this point. Jesus, earthly parent, Joseph, is now gone off the scene. And so now he's baptized, he's introduced for the very first time to the world as the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. And there are two disciples there with John that when they see Jesus, they follow Jesus. In verse 36, and looking up, uh, upon Jesus, well, we already read that. Uh, verse 37, the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Verse 38, then Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, what seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say being interpreted master. That's what the word rabbi means. It means master. Uh, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, come and see. Now here's where Creflo, Creflo Dollar and Benny Hindu and uh, Kenneth Copeland and all these other ne'er-do-wells, this is where they dream up that Jesus has this huge mansion that he lives in because he's rich. Because he's got faith and he speaks riches and he's got wealth and he's got this huge big house. I'm not kidding you. They've preached this. Um, they, they said that because Jesus, the Bible mentions Judas carried the bag, that Jesus had his own personal banker. He had to because he had so much money coming in that he had Judas taking care of his finances for him. Ridiculous stuff like that. That's, but they make that stuff up. Anyway, uh, he says, verse 39, come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak, followed him, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. What do those two words mean? The word Messiah and the word Christ both mean the same thing. They're from two different languages. Messiah is the Hebrew word and Christos is the Greek word. Uh, just like the English word water, the Spanish word agua, they both mean the same thing. So what does Messiah and Christ mean? Does anybody know? Huh? The anointed, okay? Literally anointed, like with oil poured down over his head. That's what it means. He is the one chosen and anointed specifically by God to carry out this task, to do what pleases his father. Both Messiah and Christ, they mean exactly the same thing. The Hebrew roots, sacred name movement people will tell you they, they will, you'll never hear them use the word Christ because that's a Greco-Romanized pagan term. It means something that had something to do with some pagan God years ago. And we don't use that word because that dishonors them. That's the word in our Bible. Christ. Amen. So that's what it, they both mean the same thing. Verse 42. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation, a stone. Now, take that, go to um, Peter's first letter, 1 Peter. If anybody knew what Jesus refer was referring to in this, it was Peter. He calls uh, Simon Cephas, or some say Cephas. But it's Cephas, and it mean, literally means a stone. 
so does the word Petros. It means a rock, a stone. So Peter then gives what this means, why Jesus is calling him that. And by the way, is he the only one? Is he the one that Jesus built his church on? Because he says in one of the other Gospels, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Well, the Catholic Church says that Peter is the rock upon which the church, the Holy Mother Church, is built on, and each pope sits in the chair of Peter, meaning that they've taken over Peter's position, and the church basically revolves around them as the vicar of Christ and the one who sits in the chair of Peter. But that's not true, because Peter himself said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, so he's referring to Jesus here as the living stone. The Antichrist is the opposite of that. He's the dead stone. He's the stone that was cut out with men's hands, whereas Christ is the stone who's cut without men's hands. Um, so he is, Christ is, uh, is the living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Verse 5, ye also as lively stones. We and Peter are the same in that God has made us. Remember, remember what the Pharisees said to John the Baptist. John's preaching out there and he's railing against the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees. And they beat their old chest and stuck it out. And they said, we be children unto Abraham. And John said, God is able of these stones to make raise up children unto Abraham. Well, that's he was referring to us. We are the stones, but we're not dead, non-living stones. We are living stones, lively stones that are, um, you, you also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. The house that God inhabits in the Old Testament, in Solomon's day, was made of, literally, of stone. We now are those stones. We learned from elementary school biology, middle school, junior high school, high school biology, that every part of our body was made up of little bitty things called cells. Well, those cells have their own nucleus, they have DNA in them, they have all that stuff in them. Those are the individual parts that make up the whole of my body. They look like little bitty stones that make up my skin, my bone, the tissue inside of me, my blood, everything that there is about me, my brain, everything like that is made up of these lively stones called cells Literally, I am put together piece by piece as the house of God. So are you. So are all of us together, lively stones who make up the whole house of God. Amen. That, that, he tells that to Peter. That's why he calls him that. But do not make the mistake in believing that Peter is the one that Christ built the church on. That's a lie. It's a big lie. If the church is built on one man... Surely it'll fall. Any denomination. Martin Luther, I believe, was a great man of God. I believe God inspired him to know what the grace of God and the, and the righteousness of God was all about. I believe the Holy Ghost convicted him and I believe that he died righteous. But the denomination that was built after him is Far from him. Far from him. Now, I'm not saying there's no Lutherans saved. What I'm saying is a denomination that's built upon a man usually goes corrupt after a while. Any ministry, any denomination, any church, anything like that built on one man usually will go corrupt before it's all said and done. I was talking to somebody the other day about Jerry Falwell's ministry. 
What do we see? When, when I first heard of Jerry Falwell back in the late 70s, early 80s, the guy preached right. So did Billy Graham. If you go listen to old Billy Graham sermons, he preached right. What happened? It fell into corruption over time. And now Jerry Falwell, he's dead now. His son, Jerry Jerry Jr., is now embroiled in disgusting, horrible things that him and his wife has done. Uh, I don't think the half has been told yet on, on just how corrupt that's gotten. But that's what happens when you build something on one man alone. Catholic Church is no different. So it wasn't just Peter. Okay, It's Christ, the chief cornerstone, the apostles and prophets being the foundation, us being the stones of the building, and so on. Um, so where was I now? Verse 42 which is, uh, that, that should be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Verse 43, the day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, follow me. So we have, uh, who do we have so far? By name. We have, we have John. No, we have Andrew. And we have Simon Peter. And now we have Philip. Verse 44, now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, now we got the fourth one, and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and in the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Fredericktown? Hematite, Festus. I mean, look at Nathaniel. Obviously, Nathaniel has a very low opinion of people from Nazareth. Okay? Um, so he has that. Can any good thing? You, you're saying the Messiah comes out of where? Nazareth? Is there any good thing ever come out of... You know people from Nazareth. Half my family's from Nazareth. They're all bad people. That's what he's saying. But he said, verse 47, uh, Phil, well, verse 46, Philip saith unto him, come and see. Now, some people may start out not liking the Jesus that we believe in. Give them a chance to take a look at it. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. Jesus saw Nathanael come to him and saith unto him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Jesus did not return the insult. He could have insulted Nathaniel the way Nathaniel insulted Jesus because he came from Nazareth, but he didn't. Behold in Israel in whom is no guile. Nathaniel saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. And we also know that Jesus knew Nathaniel before the foundation of the world. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. He knew it. Now, understand this. Now, I've been trying to say this for years to all of God's people who will listen. I believe that the strong delusion is going to be the biggest lie ever told. And it is going to be a such a strong delusion that if you pride yourself on never being fooled, you're going to get fooled. I firmly, absolutely believe that the dumbest Bible-believing Christian Whoever walks in shoe leather is no, going to know Jesus when they see him. I also believe that the dumbest of any of us, if we believe God's word, when we see the other Jesus, we will say, that's not my savior. How did Jesus say it? My sheep. Know my voice. 
when Hope, when my girls were little, and I mean little, little, when we were pastoring out at Richwoods, there was a farmer out there, he was a deacon in the church, and he would invite Lisa and I and the girls over for dinner sometimes after church. He had a bunch of cows out in his field. And he'd walk out there and he said, bring them girls out here. So the, take the girls out there and old Clarence would walk over next to that fence and go, Suck, 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 like that. And here come 50 cows walking that way. Now, if the girls tried it, he'd say, try it, girls. Suck, 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 and then it didn't work. Those cows knew their master's voice. They knew his voice. They knew it was him. We know our master's voice. We know it's him. When he speaketh, that's one of the how one of the hows you know, amen. He speaketh to us. Okay? We know his voice. Having never seen him, we will know him, for we will be like him in that day. Nathaniel, the moment Jesus said unto him, Behold, an Israelite in whom is no God. Nathaniel believed him right then and there. No evidence. He hadn't seen any miracles. Nothing. He just believed him. The day that I got saved, I just remember knowing that day I needed to be saved. The night that I surrendered to God's call to the ministry, it was right here. The sermon was... Must Jesus bear his cross alone? And that night, even though when I look back on my life, I can see how God was shaping my mind, my thoughts, my character, things about me to be doing what I'm doing now. But I just knew then that God, that's what God was telling me to do. God was calling me into that. When God came in my office that day and said, Mike, you know this Bible is right in everything that it says. I had no evidence whatsoever, but I, re I resolved in my mind that what God said was true and there was no argument from me whatsoever. And I'm just saying this by way of encouragement to people who are afraid. I get afraid. Sometimes I get very afraid. The older I get, if you would have known me in my teenage years and in my 20s, I was like care. I was the most carefree guy in the world. Maybe that's what happens with youth. You just think you're bulletproof and you don't, you're not scared of anything and you don't sit and worry about things. And I didn't worry about things. The older I get, the more I worry about everything. And sometimes I worry, am I going to make it? Am I going to last? Is, is this going to hurt? Okay. And I'm telling you, just as Nathaniel here knew right away, instantly, who Jesus was. He called him out. He said, you're the son of God. You're the king of Israel. I, I know it. Right now, I know it. We'll know it. We'll know it. Verse 50, when Jesus answered and said unto him, because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? He said, thou shalt see greater things than these. He said, if you, if you believe me just for this... Wait, I'm going to show you things and knock your socks off. So he says in verse 51, and he saith unto him, verily, verily, I say unto you hereafter, just to prove now, Jesus is saying, just to prove to you, you've already accepted me by faith. I knew you would. But just to prove you hereafter, ye shall see heaven open. And the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now, I like to point out that's Jacob's, that's the story of Jacob's ladder. When Jacob laid his head down on that stone and he saw that vision of a ladder that descended down from heaven and the angels of God climbing down the ladder climbing back up the ladder, going back down the ladder, back up the ladder, and so on. Angels are messengers, right? And by the way, your DNA is a ladder 
And it does exactly that. The messenger RNA agents are constantly climbing up and down the ladder of your DNA looking for genes to make. Looking for the recipe to make parts of your body with. Okay, It's exactly the same exact process as angels. And angels are made of light. They're made of fire. So is your DNA. It's made of phosphorus, which is fire light. Okay? Tracer bullets dipped in phosphorus. That way you can see them when they burn through the night. Okay? Phosphorus DNA, angels of light, everything about that matches up 100%. And Jesus is the ladder between this world and heaven. Amen. No other ladder. Amen. No rocket ship, no spaceship, no warp speed, Scotty, nothing can get us there. Only Jesus can. Amen. All right. Now, John chapter 2. That clock still, that clock says 8 o'clock. I think somebody did that on purpose so I'd quit early. Yeah. John chapter 2. The very first miracle that Jesus performed. Now, to, to me, it's interesting. And I don't, know, I don't know the answer to this. But things just stick out to me. Why is the first miracle that Jesus performed only recorded in the last gospel written? I don't know. Okay, I don't know. It, it is. This, this story of him turning the water to wine is not in Matthew, it's not in Mark, and it's not in Luke. It is unique to John. It's the only one that, that mentions this, and this is the very first miracle that Jesus performed. Why it's in this gospel, not the others, I don't know. But it just sticks out to me. There's got to be a reason for something. Every, I, I'm convinced after everything that I've seen that everything in your Bible has a reason for being there. It's like years ago when the scientists said, now you've, you know, 90% of your DNA is just junk DNA. It doesn't really do anything. They said that five years ago, 10 years ago. Now they're saying, not so fast. We think it actually does do something. Duh. Okay. If it's there, it's got a reason for being there. And God knows the reason. Amen. So notice this. Notice the language. And on the third day, the third day from what? It doesn't tell us. Is it the third day from his baptism? Is it the third day from his birthday when he turned 30? What, what The third day from what? It doesn't tell us. But it does include that little gem in this. This is a prophetic picture and it's giving you a date associated with it. It's going to happen on the third day. And I would just, uh, if you want to do a neat study, write down the phrase third day. And write down the phrase seventh day and, and look at those two phrases in the Bible. OK, now the first thing you'll notice, both of them, they're found the exact same number of times in the exact same number of verses, 52 times in 48 verses. OK, and if you look at it from God's calendar, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years. So you have Adam created, you have the creation, you have Adam, and you have the second Adam and the thousand year reign, and that's the, the week of the universe. That's God's week of everything in this universe, 7,000 years, and it's, then he's going to be done with it, and he's going to give the new heavens and the new earth, okay? If you start counting from Adam to the end of Jesus' reign, it's seven days. Then if you start from Jesus' first coming to his second coming, it's three days. So the third day from Christ's first coming and the seventh day from the creation are the same day. Third day and seventh, and seventh day, they're the exact same day. Measuring the first one from Adam, measuring the second one from Jesus' first coming. Because it's been 2,000 years since he came the first time. That's two days. He's going to spend a, a third day 
reigning over the earth and all this stupid politics that I'm sick of. My, my wife came in last night and said something about the weather. I said, Dude, what? We're getting snow tomorrow? She said, yeah, have you watched the weather? I quit watching the news. I'm not kidding you. After the election, I quit. Local news too. Quit watching. I'd rather watch Dragnet. Okay? Anyway. So he says the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. Now think of the marriage. What's that marriage about? We're going to look into all this. And the mother of Jesus was there. Not the mother of God. The mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Now, in Ephesians 5, this tells you what this marriage represents. Ephesians 5, verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined into his wife. And they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. So this marriage here is symbolic of a future prophetic event of the joining together of Christ and his bride. If you look in Matthew 25, Matthew 25, verse 1, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. We, hopefully all of us here, are the and those of you online are the five wise virgins because the lamp is the word of God. The lamp does no good if you won't read it. If it has no oil in it, if it's not lit and you're reading it, how can it shine light under your path? How can the word of God be a lamp to your feet and a light to your path if you won't read it? If you won't think about it, if you won't meditate on those things, if you won't ponder them in your heart, how can it be the, the light of your path? So there's that picture. We could go to 1 Samuel 25 and the marriage of David and Abigail with her five damsels, just like the five virgins here. It's a prophetic type. It's a shadow, foreshadowing of Jesus marrying the church. The bride of whom we are. And who's in charge of the marriage? The head is. Christ is the head. Not the bride. Amen. Not the wife. The man is in charge of this marriage. Somebody say amen. So that's what that is. And he's telling you by, this, by way of this phrase, the third day. Let's look at some other places where that phrase is mentioned. Turn to Genesis 22. Genesis chapter 22. I love Genesis 22. And 23 and 24 and 25 and 26. and All the ones before and afterward. And, and I love this because it actually matches the historical record. In Genesis 22 verse 1, it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abram, Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. So we know this is a story of God offering his son, Jesus Christ. His only begotten son, Jesus Christ. He's not offering Ishmael. He's offering, and has Ishmael been born by this time? Yes, he was born before Isaac was. But he's offering Isaac the child of promise. In verse 3, Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. How many, how many people are walking this trip here? Four. Abraham, Isaac, two servants. It's a gospel story. Okay? And clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. Look at verse 4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. I've told you before. Underline that phrase afar off. Look that up. Write that down. Look that up in your Bible. Afar off. Because you'll see it has to do with seeing into the future. Remember what I preached Sunday? You can actually look into the future. 
and see what is coming, see what is going to happen. So here is Abraham and Isaac and two servants, four of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's a sacrifice here of the only begotten son, the beloved son, the one that he doesn't want to lose, the one that's promised. Okay, but he's going to do what God told him to do. And it just happens that on the third day of their journey, they lifted up their eyes and saw the place afar off. And if you have a Bible that has like a calendar dates in it, in the chapters that tells you roughly when things happen, this story here happens 2,000 years before Jesus Christ comes. It literally is after two days, on the third day, Abraham is looking. And Mount Moriah is Golgotha. It's Calvary. It's where Jerusalem is. It is the exact place where Jesus was going to be offered up as God's only begotten son, the savior of the world, willingly. And, I, and anybody who loves the King James loves this. This got to be your favorite phrase. God will provide himself a lamb. Uh, the cathedral sing that song, God himself a lamb on that album they made with the, I heard a story about that. The cathedral's, uh, recorded this album with the London Symphony Orchestra. That's a big deal. I mean, these guys, they're very professional musicians. They do a lot of uh, film scores. They do a lot of concerts. They do a lot of recordings, things like that. Cathedrals were contracted with them to record an album and had songs written just for this symphony orchestra in the background. And Mark Trammell tells this story that when they went there and... The four singers were there. They were going to do a practice run of that song, God Himself, the Lamb. They said, so the orchestra leader led the orchestra. The orchestra starts playing the song. The, the cathedrals are practicing the song, getting the mics all right and everything like that, just running through it. Mark Trammell said, at the end of that song, that orchestra stood up and a, gave a standing ovation to the cathedrals over that song. And he said the orchestra leader had tears in his eyes over that song. God himself, the lamb. It had, and here's these lost people, musicians that are moved by the story that God offered himself in our place. Man, I love that. That's a blessing. But anyway, it's the third day. He looks afar off into the future and that's what it's pointing to you. Peter talks about being able to see things afar off. If you're right with God, you follow the scriptures, you will be able to see things coming. God has given me the ministry of a watchman. The farther off that I can see the danger coming to warn people, the better off everybody's going to be. It's a big responsibility. Turn to Exodus 19. Exodus 19, right before Exodus 20, Exodus 20 is the 70th chapter. Exodus 20 is where the Ten Commandments are. God is preparing to meet Israel for the very first time. They're fixing to see their God. They believe him, but they believe him only through Moses. Now they're going to be introduced to him. And notice what it says in verse 11. God says, and be ready against the third day. Something's going to happen on the third day. God's going to make them wait two days. For he said, for the third day, the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. This is a foreshadowing. So if you render from Christ's first coming, his second coming will be on the third day from his first coming. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about. This is mentioned in the book of Hebrews saying, take heed to yourselves that ye go not up into the mount or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall surely be put to death. There shall not an hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. Whether it be beast or man, it shall not live. And then, he's, then he puts a trumpet in here. That's what I'm waiting to hear. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mountain. Mountains always represent heaven. Valleys represent hell in the language of the Bible. So they shall come up to the mount. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people. And they washed their clothes. 
That's a picture of, our, of the righteousness of Christ washing us in his own blood, sanctifying us and covering us so that we can... You know, stupidest thing I ever heard of the other day. And I, I was, was watching a video. A guy was talking about UFOs and aliens and how the aliens originally put us here. And here's what they're saying, John. That originally man, according to the Bible, now the UFO people are saying this, that we were light beings. That we didn't have any flesh body. We were beings of light. Adam and Eve were beings of pure light in the Garden of Eden. And after they sinned, then God put coats of skins on them. Not, not covering them with animal hide to cover their nakedness. Literally putting flesh over the light. In the, That's the kind of stuff. There's a reason why I watch this stuff. Because I guarantee you that same doctrine is going to be heard in a church somewhere. If it hasn't been already. God wants to restore us to Eden. We're beings of light. All of us have a divine spark in us. Because that's where it's coming from. A divine spark of divinity in us. We're gods within ourselves. But we have this flesh body that we need to, we need to change it. Right? Right? We need to change this body. That's man's version. Anyway, um, wash their clothes. Uh, that was on verse 15. And he said unto the people, be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives. Be pure. And it came to pass on the third day. It happened exactly the way God said it would. He didn't delay. He wasn't too early. He wasn't too late. It was exactly when he said it. On the third day in the morning, early. Because the day is the thousand year reign. This is going to happen when it says it in the morning. It means it's going to happen at the beginning. The early part of the thousand year reign. Not toward the end of it. It's going to happen at the end, at the beginning of it. Early in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountain. Remember the day of the Lord is a day of clouds and thick darkness. And the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. Then, then Paul goes into detail about this. And he said, in Hebrews, we are not come to this mount that cannot be touched. We're not come to Mount Sinai. We're come to Mount Zion. The heavenly Jerusalem. A city not made with hands. Amen. That, and, and we don't have to be afraid. Can you imagine being told, don't even put your hand on that mountain. You'd be afraid of tripping. I would trip and be killed. But this one, God says, you don't have to be afraid anymore. I don't want you to be afraid anymore. And if you remember, when the Israelites heard the voice of God in Exodus 20... They freaked out. They said, don't, don't do that no more. You want to say something to us? Say it to Moses. Let Moses tell us. But we can't handle that voice. We don't have to be afraid of God's voice anymore. Amen? That's going to happen on the third day. Hosea 6. Come. T turn there and I'll be done. I'll, I'll almost be done. Hosea 6, come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Now, I've cautioned you about getting commentary Bibles. And here's why. And if I, if I knew where it was, I'd get it. I, I can't remember where I put it. The NIV Bible that I bought from my wife years ago cost me 50 bucks. And that was a lot of money. She never, she hated it. Made me mad. But I got to reading in the, it was a life application study Bible, which means that it had the scripture up here and it had a bunch of commentary notes down below. 
You know what the notes said concerning Hosea 6, verse 2? That it was the arrogance of Israel that presumed that God was going to have anything to do with them at all. And this is, they were, they were spouting off arrogance or something like that. In other words, it denied basically what is literally said in verse 2. After two days he will revive us and the third day he will raise us up. What, what did Jesus do on the third day? He rose again. Okay? And this study Bible destroyed that prophecy and said that that was nothing more than the arrogance of Israel saying that God will raise them up even though they've sinned. And I just went, even back then, I looked at that and I went, that don't sound right. That don't sound right at all. Um, Luke 13 Verse 31, the same day there came certain of the Pharisees saying unto them, Get thee out and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. And he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils and do cures today and tomorrow. And the third day I shall be perfected. Whew. I wonder who was going... Oh, let me tell Herod he said that. You'd get killed back then. 1 Corinthians 15, 4, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The third day is an important time prophecy. It's telling you that from the time of Christ's first coming to the time of his, the timing of his second coming, it's going to be 2,000 years. Now, when does that start? Obviously, it wasn't back in the year 2000. Obviously, that didn't happen. So there has to be another year that God has in mind. But I guarantee you, we're getting close to that. Two days. And then the third day, he's going to come and reign and we will be perfected on that day. Amen to that.